please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We had a mechanical difficulty. It is now corrected. This is the time set for the court to ask the questions you have submitted. Before I ask your questions, I would like to refer you back to your preliminary jury instructions, page 16. I'm going to read portions of that preliminary jury instruction to you. If you have a question about the case for a witness, write it down, but do not sign it. The lawyers and I will discuss the question. The rules of evidence or other, or other rules of law may prevent some questions from being asked. If the rules permit the question and the answer is available, an answer will be given at the earliest opportunity. When we do not ask a question, it is no reflection on the person submitting it. You should attach no significance to the failure to ask a question. I will apply the same legal standards to your questions as I do to the questions asked by the lawyers. If a particular question is not asked, please do not guess why or what the answer might have been. Ms. Arias, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. I'm going to ask the questions in the order they were submitted. Did Mr. Alexander pay for a majority of your trips? No, they were all split 50-50. If he did pay, was that a factor in you questioning his choices? For example, introdu introduction to others and sleeping arrangements. He created the itineraries, but I'm not really sure how to answer that. Um, he made all the itineraries for our trips, but we split the cost 50-50, if that makes sense. Was it his money, his choices? It was his choices on the church history trips because he knew which places would be significant in the church history. Um, I believe the choices were mutual as far as the lists that we were trying to check off for a thousand places to see. And what was the last part of that question? Was it his money, his choices? Sometimes it was his money and I would make it up to him through housekeeping. Sometimes it was my money and he would pay me back. Why did you put the camera in the washer? I don't have memory of that. I don't know why I would do that. Did you ever take pictures of yourself after he hit you? No, I did not. Why did you call the cops on your ex who shook you, but you never called the cops on Travis? When, well, that was when he tried to break my forearm. We were wrestling. I was trying to get to the phone. It seemed logical to call 911. Um, I never did with Travis because that one prior experience with calling 911, he grabbed the phone out of my hand, hung it up. It was a very negative experience. He told me to shut up, they're gonna call back. They did call back. He created an excuse as to why 911 is accidentally dialed. And so after that, I mean, this was years and years later. Um, as far as June 4th, there were no phones upstairs to my knowledge. And for previous reasons, he would make up for it in ways that Bobby didn't. Why would you continue to sleep with Travis after you learned of his child porn issues? That was not a side of Travis that, that he wanted to even exist. And of course, I didn't want it to exist. He had told me that when he slept with women. Sustained. Answer the question without referring to a statement. Okay. Um, I was under the impression that when he was able to sleep with a woman as opposed to fantasizing about a child, he felt like more normal as a, as a man. So also I had seen prior to this incident many beautiful qualities about him and good qualities about him and things that were attractive about him. And I believe that this incident was 
a negative part of himself that he didn't want to foster or that he was fighting or struggling against and that he ultimately wanted to eradicate. Why didn't you just change your Gmail password so Travis could not get into it anymore? It didn't really become a problem right away when we exchanged our passwords, and so it just stayed that way for many months. And after I moved, it became a, it became a problem. So eventually I did change my passwords. However, on, and I know this date because of our text messages and things, it was May 22nd, 2008. Um, we had a conversation, that in my journal entries, I remember. We had a conversation where we decided we're not going to do that anymore. So when, after that conversation, I made no further attempts to ever log into his accounts. And to my knowledge, I don't think he made any attempts to log into my accounts either. Did Travis's closet doors have locks on them? I don't remember them having any locks. If no, how did you have time to get the gun down if he was right behind you? I don't know if he was right behind me or not. I just had the sense that he was chasing after me. Did you record other phone sex conversations? Yes. Brian Burns testified that he met you at a PPL event in April 2008 and you had blonde hair. How is that possible if you dyed it in March 2008? Well, the reason that is the case is because I didn't meet Ryan at convention in April 2008 because convention is not in April, it's in March. So he got the month wrong is all. Convention always occurs in September and six months later in March. Why did you feel so uncomfortable about anal sex with Travis when you had previously tried it? In my previous relationships, it was only something we tried one time, maybe two times, and those were long-term relationships. The reason that that was not a regular part of the bedroom curriculum was because it was uncomfortable. And with Travis, that was his preference, and that's one of the reasons I got the KY. It made it less uncomfortable, obviously. So that's why it became more regular in our relationship. You took pictures of the shirt and shorts. Did you take pictures of the Spider-Man underwear? If no, why not? I did not take pictures of those because that's embarrassing, um, as opposed to the shorts and shirt, which were sentimental to me. I didn't want to memorialize boys' underwear, and I didn't want people to know that that was a preference of his and that I was dumb enough to go along with that preference. You told Daryl you wanted to abstain from sex until you were married. If that were the case, why did you have sexual relations with Travis? Well, my understanding at the time, Daryl and I did not, we were not intimate after convention, and shortly thereafter the missionaries began to come over to my house and preach about the law of chastity. They didn't overly preach, they mentioned it and ex explained it briefly. Um, not in great detail. I wasn't comfortable asking these two young kids that I just met um, in detail about it. But Travis and I had intimate conversations and he, how he explained it to me was that vaginal sex is absolutely off limits and everything else is not as egregious to that law. Travis stated on the phone sex conversation he did not like Spider-Man. Why did he buy you Spider-Man underwear if he did not like that character? I don't know why, but they were Spider-Man. And I, I do know, however, that prior, the year prior, he, there was a child he was close with that really liked Spider-Man. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but he was very much into Spider-Man. He would dress up as Spider-Man. He had the... Um, she was asked if she knew why. Sustained. Why would you tell Leslie you wanted your kids to play with Travis's kids if you felt Travis was into younger children? This again is a statement that I made on June 5th. 
and I wanted to be able to, I wanted to edify Travis only in good ways at that point. I didn't want to say anything bad. Even prior to June 4th, I only would have edified him in a good way rather than saying anything negative about him. I wanted, I wanted him to be cast in a good light, not a negative light. If you had bruises that were visible after the April 2008 incident, why is it no one else said anything to you about those bruises? Well, that's, that's not really true. Um, the same day that the bruises occurred, there was a PPL associate who made a joke about it. Um, it was very embarrassing. He just, there were people around, we were at a business briefing, he joked about it. Um, Travis was in the joke. And I got, I don't know if I got beat red, but it felt like I did. Um, I thought I, the makeup was covering them sufficiently. And then also, Matt was somewhat confrontational about it. And at that point, I was putting more makeup on. I had foundation cover up, something that was very opaque that I was putting on them from that point on. If you were so nearsighted, how were you able to drive? I never had a problem driving. Um, when I was on the freeway, I mean, I could see objects. They weren't very sharp, but they were sharp enough to where I could see whether or not I was in danger or driving safely or not. As far as freeway signs, I had to get closer to them to actually see what they said. But as far as I knew, that was normal vision. I'd never had glasses my entire life. And in 2010, I put on someone else's just for fun. And it was like, I didn't even know that you could see the world that way. Everything was sharp. So that's when I realized I need glasses. In Travis's text to Jody, text 12308, exhibit 444. He talks about the mysterious man you've never seen before that wrote for you. Who is this man and why is he bringing it up? That man would be Steve Carroll. He wrote me a very nice email and it went to my Gmail account, which Travis read. And when I tried to explain myself, I said I've never even met him. And so he I guess he thought he was a mysterious man, but I had never met Steve, that's what I told him, and it led to a big fight. Did Travis think it was someone you lied about? I think he did, the way he postured his words. You took a picture of the t-shirt and pink shorts, but not the boys' underwear. Why were the pictures taken so much later? They were taken in July. Um, I knew my time was winding down. And by that point, I had heard several rumors that said I was obsessed and all these things. And I thought, well, if somebody finds these, it does look a little strange to have a shirt that says Travis Alexander's and Travis is across the seat on the back of these shorts. But, so I didn't want those to be found. I knew I was going to be arrested. But they were sentimental to me. So I still wanted to memorialize them in some way. So I laid them out and I photographed them because they were special to me. You testified that Travis gave you the Book of Mormon at Starbucks. Did you read it thoroughly? If so, when? I did read the Book of Mormon thoroughly. Um, following that meeting, I attempted to read one chapter a day, and so I finished it sometime, I think I finished it in about eight months, more or less, and then thereafter in 2008, I read it, I started January 1st and read one chapter a day, not always consistently, but more or less, or I'd make up for it, and then I did that in 2009 and 10, and I haven't done it since. Does the Book of Mormon go into detail regarding the vow of chastity? It doesn't give explicit detail, but it does, and it doesn't even say law of chastity to my recollection. It just talks about, it uses verbiage such as whoredoms, things like that, um, being unclean, and that's all in reference to sexual sin. So it doesn't go into detail, but it does reference that those things are considered sinful. Who initiated contact after the various breakups with Bobby, Matt, Daryl and Travis. Start with Bobby. Um, let's see. With Bobby, we broke up and got together so many times, it would be hard to remember exactly what times when. Um, let's 
See, I know there was one time where I was packing all of my things and leaving. I was packing all my cars, driving away. Um, he lived in Montague. It's isolated. It's a tiny little town, about a thousand people. He had, his parents had already left to go into a rest home. He had nothing. He had no, no food, no money, nothing. So I sort of initiated contact in a way because after I took all my things to my grandmother's house, I went to the grocery store, I bought him a bunch of groceries and I brought them over to his house and I left them on the door and I left and he called me back for that. So in a way I initiated that contact by leaving the groceries on his porch and he knew it was me because he liked certain types of food and I got him those kinds. Yes. Excuse me, Your Honor. The human device is coming in and out. I want to make sure I hear everything. Could we address that? Yes, we will address that. It could be part of the issue we were having earlier. We're going to give you another headset. We'll see if that helps. Sirius, I'm going to ask you to move the microphone back just slightly, back, Sorry. further back. That might help the issue as well. Sir, can you hear me now? It doesn't make any difference. All right, we are going to contact someone. So what we'll do is we'll take a recess and attempt to address that issue, and then we'll, we'll be back with you shortly. So I'm going to ask the jury to go back to the jury room at this time. Courtroom, you may be seated. We are at recess for approximately five minutes. 